Kia ora everybody. This room has got to be the quietest room I have ever been in in a discussion about culture. Culture to me is very noisy. It's lively and it creates movement and singing and, and uh, great debates and discussion. Uh, so it's, um, it's a little difficult, I have to say, to stand here and talk to you. Um, I am at the IUCN and I just wanted to make an observation that I've really noticed during this Congress that there's all this hive of activity around the environment and culture. And over in IUCN there's all this hive of activity around environment and culture. And why don't organisations and networks talk more to each other? Because we're all actually saying the same things. And we have massive networks of people mobilised to do this very work, but we don't seem to coordinate. Uh, so although I am with IUCN, I'm, I want to talk to you here about uh, my own culture. So, ko putuaki toku manga, ko rangi taiki toku awa, ko ngati awa toku iwi, no reira, ko aroha te pareaki need a hau. So in my, uh, I'm Māori from New Zealand, and in my language, it's very important to note here that not only do we introduce ourselves based on our ancestral landscape and heritage and ancestors, but the language in which we do this places us as a lesser being than nature. So the term we're talking is giving dignity, a greater dignity to the mountain than to me. And then I use the word tapu to talk about myself because I'm lesser in this. I think with many indigenous cultures and with other cultures around the world, to have humans as less than nature is, is a consistent value. And it's when we move into situations where we place humans above nature that we make really poor decisions. And what I'm very proud of with my own people is that in spite of all that's happened to us, the language has remained, and this way of introducing ourselves has remained, and the relationship we have to the environment has remained. Ooh. So, my, my, um, the moderator here, he told us this morning we had to condense to five slides, so I'm going to have to do some editing here. So this is a New Zealand that you may not know well. Um, this is a map of all the tribes. There are over 63, and that number continues to change because we're going through a very comprehensive system in New Zealand of redressing historical grievances. And as these are negotiated and completed new iwi emerge. Tribes that weren't acknowledged by the Crown uh, begin to see a, a day of light. But when you look back to my introduction, so it will say that I come from Ngāti Awa, and I have a sacred mountain and a sacred river, and I have this whole landscape around me of sacred places, so too do all the other tribes. So when we're introducing ourselves by our mountains, we're actually also connecting at an environmental level, at, at a spiritual level, at a cultural level. And when something happens to someone's mountain, we all feel it, because we understand what that link is. So if somebody decides to go and do offshore drilling on a coast, then all of Māori tribes react to it, because they realise the impact that that will have. What many people don't realise in this in New Zealand is that this beautiful map there, you can just see these little speckles of, uh, of uh, brown sort of sand colour. That is all that is left in New Zealand in Māori land ownership. So Māori experience a very dramatic rate of land alienation over the space of 60 years from 100% owners to less than five percent. And it is a real testimony to the resilience of the people that in spite of not being recognized as owners of their traditional territories, the culture has remained and remained very strongly. 
and also that it the so the relationship that Māori have had to negotiate with government and with other New Zealanders hasn't been on the basis of rights. It's been based on a cultural value of being guardians. And that guardianship exists whether you own something or whether you don't, simply because it's part of your heritage. So when I was looking at the question, how does culture enable environmental sustainability, I think through our cultural values, um, culture is more likely to make decisions that look at long-term intergenerational planning. And these decisions are often disputed by government, by other people who live in the same communities because they're wanting shorter-term gains. But it is usually Māori, it's usually indigenous peoples in other parts of the world who are looking ahead, not to when we're still here on this earth, but many generations from now. Also, with uh, Māori culture and other indigenous cultures, it's values-based. Decisions are made based on very strict values around that relationship with the environment. So we can call it guardianship. And this has always been one of the big um, problems in dealing with indigenous issues and sustainable development because of the, this term guardianship and not ownership. But I think uh, indigenous peoples have held very firmly to try to remain acknowledged as guardians, but knowing that under, underlying that there is a need to respect rights. And so my next point is that where there have been grievances through wrongful uh, treatment of people and where a culture has been denied, these must be resolved. You cannot move forward without addressing the wrongs of the past. And then going into that next level of discussion around negotiating with indigenous peoples and others shared responsibilities for the management resources or even transferred, that can only happen after, after the historical grievances have been addressed. Because to go straight into a shared uh, responsibility without acknowledging the impact that being removed from land has had on a culture uh, it puts everyone at risk. So I could have many things, but because I'm going to be a very obedient, which I never am, but for you I will be obedient, and I will stick to just these slides, um, we'll, we'll be able to talk later. Thank, Thank you, Anna.